You can see these scary signs around Johnson Shut-In State Park in Missouri. If you hear a warning siren, leave the area immediately. That's what the sign's warning about. Now we just need to figure out why. The thing is, at the summit of the nearby hill, there's this giant reservoir called Tom Sock, which once led to a local disaster. Tom Sock. Let's take a closer look at this giant reservoir. It has the following dimensions. 6,900 feet long, 151 feet wide, and can hold 1.4 billion gallons of water. Sadly, you can't swim in it. Thalassophobia might even affect those who didn't have it before. There are no visitors here. The depth inside is 121 feet, and besides water, there's absolutely nothing. And it should be said that this artificial reservoir wasn't created for swimming. And no, it's not a giant water reservoir for all of humanity's needs. Maybe it's a hydropower plant? It sure looks similar. For example, take the Hoover Dam. The scale is definitely different. The structure on the border of Arizona and Nevada is 660 feet wide at its base, 725 feet tall, and creates Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the country. The Hoover Dam's job is to hold back huge amounts of water, which is kind of like what our giant pool does. No more building up the mystery. What we've got here is a pumped storage power plant, or PSP for short. Principle of work. However, just saying what they are doesn't make it any easier to understand. Some people probably don't know what these pump storage hydroelectric plants are. In the U.S., as of 2023, there were only 43 PSP, and worldwide, based on 2010 data, there were 460 such facilities. In general, there aren't many of them, so let's first figure out what exactly they are. The way pump storage power plants work is pretty much like regular hydropower stations. They produce electricity from moving water. But unlike typical hydro plants, pumped storage ones have two separate reservoirs, with one being higher than the other. And somewhere in between, you'll find turbines and pumps. Our hero today, the Tom Sock Pump Storage Plant, has its upper reservoir located on a mountain. That's the huge reservoir. As for the lower reservoir, it's a bit harder to find. It's a 450 megawatt hydropower station located 755 feet lower on the Black River and connected to the reservoir by a 6,900 foot long tunnel drilled into the mountain. The key thing that makes pumped storage plants stand out from a lot of other energy sources, including regular hydropower stations, is that they can easily adjust to shifts in electricity consumption. Let's take an ordinary city as an example. In the morning and evening, it needs a lot of electricity. People work on computers, use washing machines, microwaves, electric stoves, and other appliances. At night, people are usually sleeping, and during the day, they're at work. So overall consumption drops significantly. Why not save on that? That's why people came up with pumped storage power stations. During peak demand times, the station opens a gate, allowing water from the upper reservoir to flow down through pipes into the lower one, passing through turbines that generate electricity. It's the usual process for any hydroelectric plant, but when demand is low, cheap electricity powers pumps that push the water back to the upper pool. Why is this so useful in the modern world? Because nuclear and thermal power plants don't handle rapid changes in output very well. Moreover, abruptly changing their operations can be dangerous. Pumped storage plants are also an excellent complement to renewable energy. When the sun is out and the wind is blowing, the energy from solar panels and wind turbines pumps water into the upper reservoir. When the green generators aren't producing anything, the water is released to flow down, generating electricity. To put it simply, we're looking at huge batteries. But our Tom Sock pump storage plants different from other similar stations. We think you've already noticed how. Usually, reservoirs are built in spots that nature has already made convenient. But here, Union Electric decided to build the upper reservoir on a flat surface. Back in 1953, the company was searching for a spot to build and decided to focus on areas that would let them use a smaller reservoir for storage and provide a strong water flow. Ultimately, the selected location offered an elevation difference of around 750 feet, and the water pressure reached such a high level that it surpassed that of the Hoover Dam, which we mentioned earlier today. Overall, the choice was completely justified. Accident Back in 1963, the launch of the Tom Sock pump storage plant was groundbreaking, at least in the U.S., 
Its head was the highest in the country, making it the most powerful, and it was described as the first large-scale pumped storage plant. You think people didn't know about remote control in the mid-20th century? Oh, they knew all right. TomSock could be managed by human operators from 90 to 120 miles away. But the designers didn't stop there. They equipped the station with the ability to operate fully automatically. To give you an idea of just how innovative the TomSock pump storage plant was back in the day, it stood alongside inventions like satellite TV, the Macintosh computer, and digital cameras, not to mention countless other breakthroughs. Of course, the overall impact of these other inventions is far greater, but it still shows how impressive this solution was in the last century. In 2005, just a few months after the station was deemed a breakthrough, something happened that you've probably seen in some videos. A damn wall burst. A spectacular but terrifying event that could lead to catastrophic consequences for the entire surrounding area, the infrastructure on it, and the people nearby. Here's roughly what it looked like. At one point, a parapet wall collapsed and all that huge amount of water spilled out. How long did it take? Just 12 minutes. We bet you can imagine how destructive the flow was, and if not, take a look at these scenes. A torrent of water from the mountain pool rushed downward, sweeping away trees and rocks in its path. In no time, an open path had formed from the top reservoir down to Johnson's shut-ins park. By some lucky chance, the breach happened in winter when the park was practically empty. Only the manager and his family were there, but nothing serious happened to him, even though his house was swept away with the water's current. Just imagine the damage this kind of water rush could have caused after sweeping through the park. But something incredible happened. All the water rushed into the lower reservoir, where it would have ended up anyway due to how the pump storage plant works. Along the way, of course, trees were knocked down, cars were washed away, but in the end, you could say it went as well as it could have. Causes of the Accident Naturally, an investigation into what happened was launched. The task was assigned to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It should be noted that almost always in these situations, the cause is a bunch of small mistakes made by people or the influence of nature. But the Tom Sock station, though, it was the people at fault. To begin with, let's take a look at this video. Yeah, the reservoir walls weren't entirely made of concrete like the video we showed. They were a stone embankment with a concrete finish on the inside. So what they found out is that a lot more soil was added to the embankment than necessary, which led to a greater settling over time. On top of that, the weak areas of soil at the base weren't reinforced properly. All of this together caused the section of the dam to settle. To be more specific, some parts of the parapet wall that eventually crumbled were 24 inches lower. Now let's remember that the station was controlled remotely or even worked automatically, so someone from a distance would press buttons to drain and raise the water. Monitoring to ensure the water didn't spill over the edge was done using level sensors placed on the walls of the pool. This is where another mistake comes to light. When the sensors were installed, the workers didn't take into account that, due to the settling, part of the wall was lower than the rest, which meant the equipment didn't properly measure the actual water level in the tank. The water slowly overflowed, which led them to eventually perform a check. But nothing was fixed. Instead, the workers opted to simply add a certain number of inches of water to the data. They didn't even notify the regulatory authorities about the problem, so there were no checks or extra control. As a result, water kept spilling over from the sunken side, which caused erosion and eventually led to the collapse in 2005. Well, if you think that was the only reason the reservoir made from an innovative solution turned into a disaster, I must add, the upper reservoir didn't have a spillway. So you couldn't just safely release the needed water like you can on most dams, for example. Tom Sock Today after all the legal battles and a $15 million fine from the Federal Energy Commission, which, by the way, turned out to be the largest fine ever imposed, the destroyed park was restored. Now the only thing left to remind people of the terrible incident are the same signs telling you to run as far as you can in case of an emergency, 
and the path made by the water flow. What's going on with the upper reservoir of Tomsok? The clips we've already shown today are the latest views it has at the moment. Yeah, they renovated it. It was decided not to make the same mistakes as before and to build the structure from compacted concrete, meaning a dry concrete mix that's processed on-site with special equipment and compacted with rollers. Now the pool on the mountain's more reliable and has earned the title of the largest dam made of roller compacted concrete. However, there's still the Rockville embankment, which was crushed and turned into aggregate for the concrete. And most importantly, they finally added a spillway to the structure, which will help avoid a lot of unpleasant events. On February 27th, the restored reservoir was filled with water for the first time since the accident. Everyone involved in the project kept an eye on how the structure reacted as the water level kept rising and falling. But in the end, everything went well, and final approval was given by the Federal Commission. The Tomsock pump storage plant started generating electricity for the first time since the 2005 events on April 21, 2010. The ultimate measure of success for the reconstruction and subsequent launch was the redesignation of the Tomsock pump storage plant as a milestone on September 27, 2010. K2 Hydro Right now, we're seeing more and more pump storage plants being built. You think they're learning from the Tom Sock Station's mistakes? At least in one way, they surely are. Engineers aren't putting up walls on flat mountains anymore, but are trying to use what nature has already shaped, or what's already been built by people, like the K2 Hydro Station. First of all, this is the first pump storage project in Australia in the last 40 years. And at Gen X Power, the company behind it, they decided to really give it their best shot. A pump storage plant's being built on the site of a historic gold mine in northern Queensland, which had been in operation for over 90 years before closing in 2001. Using the pits already dug by humans, which are perfectly suited for creating water reservoirs, is a smart move. It's also cheaper than building walls on a bare mountain slope. Although, in fact, you can't really say that. The project's funded through a 15-year loan of $470 million. However, the cost can be justified by the scale of the project. A pit called Wises is used for the upper reservoir. The walls of the pit will need to be expanded and reinforced using the existing waste rock dumps on the site. Additionally, a high-density polyethylene liner will be laid down to provide effective sealing. For the lower tank, Gen X Power has selected a pit called Eldridge with a depth of 1,050 feet. As stated, it holds most of the 7.1 billion gallons of water that are planned to be stored within the system. The costs also include the creation of two vertical pressure tunnels with concrete lining, each 1,115 feet long and with a height difference of 823 feet. And of course, they need to build an underground power station building where the turbines and pumps will be located. They plan to place it inside a cave that's 295 feet long, 57 feet wide and 148 feet high. The K2 Hydro project, as claimed, will store and distribute 2,000 megawatt hours of electricity with each generation cycle. This will be enough to power 143,000 homes for at least six hours. Sand batteries. Storing energy with a pump storage plant seems odd? Well, you probably haven't seen sand batteries yet. The company Polar Night Energy suggests filling regular, clean sand into reservoirs with a diameter of 13 feet and a height of 23 feet tall. The main goal of this system is to solve the problem that converting electricity into heat is pretty easy, but turning heat energy back is a whole lot harder. To do this, the engineers at the company suggest heating sand up to 932 to 1,112 degrees Fahrenheit and keeping it hot inside a highly insulated tank. So how will the sand turn back into electricity? Well, if you know how geothermal stations work, it'll be pretty easy to understand. Pipes carrying regular water will pass through the tank, heating up from the hot sand. After that, the water can be pumped into the heating system to warm up various buildings. It's said that the main advantage of sand over liquid alternatives is that the substance inside the tanks is static, meaning it doesn't mix. This allows different layers of sand to have different temperatures, and you can run pipes for different purposes through them. Because you don't always need boiling hot water at the output, 